So the monthly pays a 30 billion euro that's tended to run until the end of September 2000. Hi, thanks for tuning in to Bloomberg Queen. Time in conversation with Paul Sherd, Vice Chairman at S&P Global. Paul, thank you so much for speaking to us here it's in Davos. Uh, let me start by asking you what you make of all the expectations that this will be a strong year of growth for the global economy. Um, because even as we are having that conversation, we hear the U.S. government, you know, make its position fairly clear on the U.S. dollar and, and wanting weakening further of the dollar. Some economists expressing concern on whether inflation might rise faster and therefore we might see a faster pickup in interest rates. Uh, you know, all of these are risks. Crude oil prices are a risk to global recovery. So could you say with conviction that this is the year when we're finally going to leave the global financial crisis behind us? Well, I've, Milaka, I've been using the, the, the phrase of the, the global financial crisis and the Great Recession have been casting a, a long shadow. But that shadow is getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. We're, we're up to the 10th anniversary of the, uh, the crisis this, this year and so about nine, eight, year, eight or nine years into the expansion. Um, and a lot has happened. But um, so I think, yes, it is. It does look like it's going to be a good year for growth. Um, firing on all cylinders might be a little bit strong, but a, a kind of a synchronized recovery mm -hmm. where we're probably moving up a notch or so. Um, but of course, that doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of risks and also structural issues that need to be addressed as well. Okay. And of course, any forecast that you're going to hear from an economist uh, is, of course, a baseline forecast. What is sort of the most likely outcome? But I wouldn't get too obsessed about the decimal point. I wouldn't. I'm not going to bring up the decimal points. Uh, you said both risks and structural issues. Let's talk about the risks first. A weakening dollar can mean many different things for different parts of the world. Uh, definitely good news for the U.S. So will the U.S. be the key driver of growth this year and the next few years from here on? I think it's going to be, a, I think, a key contributor, uh, definitely with the, the tax package, which you may want to ask about, uh, coming through. That's yes, going to absolutely. give a bit of a boost to GDP growth. But I think this was looking like a fairly decent year anyway. Uh, the labor market is getting tighter and tighter in the U.S. Uh, and that, you know, that means there's more chance of, of virtuous cycles developing mm -hmm. and you build know, a bit of a pickup in business investment as well. So all of that's, uh, that's there. Um, and, but, you know, it's not just the U.S. anymore. We've also got, you know, other major economies, Europe, China, India increasingly is, is an important player in the global economy as well. And Japan as well um, mm -hmm. is, is doing quite nicely. So you, you would call it secular growth? That's a word that economists like to use a lot. Uh, uh, well, secular, secular, uh, cyclical, uh, you know, uh, there's a number of different terms that you can use. Crude oil prices, weaker dollar, uh, inflation faster than anticipated. Do you believe the interest rate situation could change faster than we had anticipated? Which of the risks and how would you rank them? Probably, I mean, I'm not so concerned about the, the inflation risk You're or the, the, yeah, okay. the, the sort of interest rate uh, hike risk, risk. I mean, it's interesting to reflect that, uh, of course, Janet Yellen is about to step down from her uh, four-year term uh, at the Federal Reserve. And um, and a lot of talk here about Janet Yellen's legacy, no, but actually yes. when you think about it, it's pretty good. She came in and she finished off uh, the forward guidance that was in place from Chairman Bernanke, uh, completed the tapering, made the first interest rate hike, did five interest rate hikes, and then uh, began the unwind of the Fed's balance sheet, and uh, everything seems to be looking quite rosy. So one of the dogs that didn't bark, Manaka, was of course the, f the, the concern that if the Fed started to raise interest rates, everything would come tumbling down. Right. So um, you know, I never really bought into that story. I think we've got a lot of evidence now that you know, the, if the economy is strong and if the central bank is justified in starting to normalize monetary policy, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But if I was going to worry about something that perhaps is not on that list it would be the trade uh, picture. Uh, we have the NAFTA negotiations, uh, which are sort of running their course uh, in the first quarter of this year. Doesn't look so good at the moment. Uh, there are some trade actions out vis-a-vis -vis, uh, towards China from the US. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, there's a bit of a wild card as we move up towards the midterm congressional elections. OK, I'm going to come back to the issue of trade because I want to link it to the conversation around globalization that's taking place here. But before that, uh, why are you not worried about 
somewhat higher crude prices may be derailing some of this global recovery, uh, you know, especially if, as, as we're seeing right now, accompanied, uh, you know, by a weaker dollar. Higher oil prices in, in particular. Higher oil prices. Oil prices, yes. yes. Well, I mean, oil is really, I mean, it's an important macro number, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's, it's one commodity and its price goes up and down, you know, depending essentially on supply and demand. Um, the big secular decline in oil prices seems to have happened from those highs of, you know, 120 to 140 dollar range we had a few years ago. And now we're in this 50 to 70 dollar kind of maybe a little bit higher range. But the, the key point, I think, Menaka, would be that if oil prices sort of threaten to break out on the upside, um, we have had the shale, oil and gas revolution. And that capital is quite nimble, uh, and uh, it's a very entrepreneurial kind of sector. So uh, the swing producer seems to be more shale now than uh, the Middle East. That will keep a cap on oil prices. Okay. There's also this perception uh, that some people have shared that maybe, uh, you know, the markets haven't quite priced in a faster than expected rise in interest rates. Now, I know you just told me that that's not on your list of risks, um, but do you believe that the markets are a lot more benign towards the interest rate situation, rightly so, wrongly so? Uh, I think in, in parts. I mean, obviously, in the U.S., U.S. Treasuries have moved up, um, not quite in yes. lockstep with the Fed, but uh, they are kind of responding. Um, there is a big debate among you know, economists and, and the market participants about, you know, is inflation around the corner? And particularly I'm thinking of the U.S., where the labor market ostensibly looks quite tight. Or um, is there actually maybe because of uh, some residual scars from the financial crisis or issues to do with technology, mm -hmm. workers competing with machines and artificial intelligence, not just other workers, um, is there a potential for the labor market to actually um, improve much more dramatically before we start to trigger inflation. That's an uncertainty that the Fed has to grapple with. But and we'll find out the answer over the next one to two years. That is, as unemployment comes down, does inflation pick up or does it just lead to more, uh, more robust uh, employment growth? Um, but whatever the answer is, the Fed is going to then respond to that reality. And if it means um, inflation comes a little bit quicker, we get more interest rate, rate hikes than are currently being priced in, Markets will have to adjust. Yes, the Fed will have to adjust. But that doesn't necessarily mean a disaster for the economy because, again, it will be indicative of an underlying tight labor market. And um, you know, who doesn't want a tight labor market? Fair enough. Uh, when you look at equity markets, do you believe that they're overvalued at this point in time? Some people have used the word bubble territory. Mm. Well, uh, I think as an economist, Minaka, I mean, I'm I, 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 A, reluctant to call the market. Yes, I and, But B, also um, a little bit disciplined about the, use I, the way I use the word bubble. Yes. And I think we always have to... Uh, uh, I'll leave it to the equity strategists okay. to make the exact call, right. but we have to be careful. Are we talking about an, a, a, a market that is perhaps richly valued? Richly valued. It's, okay. it's maybe valuations are at a stretch, or is it in true bubble territory? Bubble territory is when the valuations get completely out of whack uh, with underlying fundamentals, and uh, we don't seem to be in that territory, I guess. Okay. So then let me come to the second issue I wanted to talk to you about, Paul, and that is the issue of globalization. Uh, Davos seems a little behind the curve in catching up to the conversation on the unequal or unequal outcomes of globalization across the world, right? And I think uh, we're seeing that. That's fundamental reason why we haven't seen inflation move up. Wages haven't moved up as much. Uh, what do you make of the different comments you've seen leaders here make, whether it's Prime Minister Modi or Justin Trudeau or Emmanuel Macron? Uh, they've all spoken about wanting to review uh, the outcomes of globalization, the way countries go about continuing to trade with each other. Do you think that if 2018 10 years after the global financial crisis marks maybe the first year of some degree of normalcy, then this conversation has some potential of changing the structural recovery from here onwards. Mm. Well, I think it's, it's the issue of the day. Um, and uh, you know, Thomas Piketty uh, put, the, cap, uh, put the, uh, the, the topic right on the, uh, the front burner back in 2014 with mm. his book, uh, Capitalism uh, in the, for the 21st Century. In the 21st century. Um, we, we've saw, seen this rise of so-called populism. I'm a little bit reluctant to use the term, but clearly uh, there's a discontent in many parts of the electorate uh, related to globalization. But there's globalization and there's technology, uh, technological um, uh, innovation as well, and those two things sort of get mixed up. One drives the other. Um, but I think, you know, a little bit of a, perhaps a mere culpa from, I won't apologize on behalf of the economics profession, but as an economist, um, you know, I do feel that we perhaps uh, focused too much 
focused directly on the gains from trade. We, we were very much you know, at the forefront of promoting globalization as a good thing. That obviously has influenced very much the policy world. But what economics tells you is that there are gains from trade, but there are also winners and losers. Yeah. And the gains from trade proposition essentially is to say the winners are better off and they can more than compensate any losers. Everybody can be better off. But you still need the actual mechanisms, the instruments to compensate the losers from trade. And I think with some of the sort of market fundamentalism that was very strong, if you remember running up to the financial crisis where markets were the savior of all, that point really did not get adequate attention. And perhaps labor markets were not as flexible as economists had assumed. And particularly the financial crisis and the housing market downturn locked people into their locales much, much more. So I think there's a lot of issues here that uh, economists and, and public policy people and governments and politicians have to sort of take a bit more of a deep dive revisit some of their basic assumptions uh, and maybe make some uh, key adjustments to uh, public policy. I know it's uh, early to tell and I know also that it's going to depend from country to country, region to region, leader to leader and people to people. Um, but do you see at this point in time, I think the mechanisms for compensation playing out in a way where one country adopts a particular mechanism and it has a collateral impact on you know, other aspects of global trade uh, can you give us a sense of how you expect some of this to pan out over the next few years? It's, it's, a, it, it's, it's a difficult uh, topic. I think you know, different countries will have di uh, uh, predisposed to, uh, in, to, to really look at this issue in different ways and have different solutions. I think you know, part of the problem perhaps in the U.S. is that if we're talking about, look, uh, we've got to really focus on the redistribution issues much more, society. Mm. Um, that does imply some role for government. And government tends to be a little bit of a dirty word in the United States, big government. So I think there's a little bit more of a, of a challenge in the U.S. of how to, to navigate around these issues. But it shouldn't be beyond the wits of, of man to find some solutions. I think in Europe, uh, China, some of these other economies, maybe India as well, where the concept of inclusive growth uh, has been around for a very long time, um, I think it's perhaps a little bit easier for the governments to come up with uh, policy prescriptions that um, you know, will, will deal with this problem of inequality and losers from globalization and technology. But do you see a diminishment in global trade on account of some of these issues? Uh, I think that, I wouldn't look at that as a base case. I mean, I, I think that, um, so I guess one question here is, do we get, um, pop, call them populist movements, for one of a better word, sort of spilling over into protectionism, trade barriers, trade wars. We've been cetera. hearing those noises for two years the noises. Now. Yeah. We've, we've heard the noises, we've seen a little bit of action, but I think it's still a long way to travel to get to the fully fledged protectionism and, and, and sort of trade, trade wars. I think what will be interesting tomorrow with uh, Pre President Donald Trump's uh, speech is what pitch he makes to the Davos elites, as they're called. Um, and, you know, I don't think that necessarily a lot of the issues that sort of he's represented are necessarily inconsistent with globalization itself. So can those two streams be kind of melded? Um, you know, in, in, a, in a more positive uh, direction would be, I think, the, uh, the key Paul, I would tomorrow. always hesitate to disagree with you, but I, I have to raise the issue of the duty on washing machines. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have to raise the issue that you have the Treasury Secretary say, hey, a cheaper dollar is great for trade. These are protectionist measures. These are nothing but protectionist measures. I mean, you can, I know the wall hasn't gone up yet, right. um, but, you know, you don't need a physical wall to tell you that countries are now focused on local industry and local jobs and nothing wrong with that but it does change the way we will see global growth occur uh, you know over the next five seven ten years yeah well, I mean as I said there are some there are some instances at the moment um, some of the trade actions that have been been taken just in the last couple of weeks but you know the whole post-war period has been littered with examples like that so I think it's a little bit early to say there's a, there's a sort of a, a, a watershed moment a game change here um, but it is a risk as we talked about I think the NAFTA negotiations which do not appear to have been going particularly well um, we're going to get uh, a good read on that probably within the next couple of months. But, you know, again, I think the, the economies are becoming much more service orientated. Um, the digital economy, mm. um, uh, internet, everything that we, 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 we've now got used to. So it's, it's going to be difficult, I think, to, to turn the clock back on what, what people are calling globalization.
Yeah, fair enough. And I think just in the beginning of the week, we heard that the TPP was going to go ahead with 11 partners mm -hmm. and the U.S. So uh, maybe, you know, it isn't as if all is lost uh, on that count. Uh, one final mm -hmm. question, and that has to do with India. Um, you have objectivity, you have distance. Look <laughs> at India and tell me uh, how that story is looking at this point in time. We had an interesting last two years, demonetization, the implementation of GST, mm -hmm. both terribly disruptive forces, one a negative disruptive force, one a positive disruptive mm -hmm. force. Uh, you know, and, and then we had a Moody's upgrade last year, and many of us were wondering whether, you know, Moody's got it right ahead of the curve, behind the curve. Uh, what do you make of India? Mm. Well, I take my cue from our, my colleague DK Joshi at Crystal, yes. who's as part of our t uh, broader team, um, on the Indian economy. But uh, we were pretty positive. Um, last year, there were some headwinds, the GST, uh, the uh, sort of uh, effect of the demonetization shock. There were two surprises oh, mm. on November 8th, uh, 2016. Um, but yeah, I think the economy has digested much of that now. And the GST in particular, we see as a very positive yes. uh, reform for the longer term. But, you know, I'm always quite excited about India, not because I'm on Indian television here, <laughs> Manaka, but um, you know, you've got so many pluses with uh, the, you know, the the demographics, the, the growth potential, the economic development potential, the huge domestic market that you have with your huge population, uh, the, the very huge uh, diaspora and the way that that is connected back into the country. Um, there are so many pluses and of course you have a, a reform orientated government. Now I know the politics are messy and there's a lot of chaos uh, in, in different uh, dimensions in, in, in India but that's part of the attraction. But you know we see India growing at you know seven and a half to, to high sevens territory for the next few years. There's a long runway of economic development potential um, and I think uh, you know, public policy reform etc is very important uh, but uh, fundamentally you know I'm quite positive about the outlook for India. Paul we leave it there. Thank you so much for your time here in Davos. It's a pleasure. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks, Thanks. very much. Thanks, Benaka. Our friends are abroad.